Greater Tucson. <laughs> I am Vivian Hart, and I am the president of the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson. We want to thank you for coming and supporting us and our activities and helping us to celebrate our 100th anniversary. Yeah! <laughs> So here's the really interesting thing. The League of Women Voters started in 1920 in February, but the 19th Amendment was certified in August of 1920. So we started six months before because the women were really sure it was going to pass and they wanted to be ready to get people to vote and be smart, intelligent voters. We are an all-volunteer organization here in Tucson. We are nonpartisan, which means we do not oppose or support any particular candidate or any particular political party. So the first thing we're going to do is to honor the honorees. We have a number of wonderful women who are being honored today. So, we are going to start with our platinum sponsors. Pasquayaki Tribe is honoring Winona Baldenegro. Tucson Medical Center is honoring Julia Strange. Our gold sponsors, Amerigroup is honoring Yvonne Keen. Pima Council on Aging is honoring Elizabeth Davidson. And now for our silver sponsors, Cox Communications is honoring Karen Rodriguez. Cushman and Wakefield Picor Commercial Real Estate is honoring Barbie Reuter. El Rio Health is honoring Kate Breck Calhoun. Southwest Gas is honoring Jan Lesher. Two more of our silver sponsors are HSL Properties and Thomas R. Brown Foundation. And now for our bronze sponsors. Assured Partners is honoring Melanie Honomichi. Betty Bankson is honoring Shirley Sandylands. Maria Bothwell and Emily Ricketts are honoring Barbea Williams. Phyllis Carnahan and Mary Elizabeth Pollard are honoring Anna Hacker. Brenda Goldsmith is honoring Veronica Mercado Cruz. Karen Randolph and Sarah Schifrin are honoring our county recorder, F. Ann Rodriguez. Carol West and Pat Wiedhoff are honoring Hershella Horton. Marcy Wood is honoring Dr. Kathy Carter. Desert Diamond Casinos and Entertainment is also one of our bronze sponsors. Let's have a round of applause for all of our honorees. <laughs> we also have a number of table sponsors for which we are grateful. Pima Community College, Halualoa, Pima County Tucson Women's Commission, Laura Almquist and Betsy Bolding, Shirley Sandylands and Carol Shear, and Adrian Barton and Judy Wood. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Now, as I said, this is the 100th anniversary of the League of Women Voters. And we would like every single person who is well, not current president, I'm already standing, but any past president of this league or a state league or any other league throughout the country, please stand and be recognized. Now, how many of you are not league members here? Raise your hand if you're not a league member. All right, the many of you. So I want to share with you quickly what our three missions are. The first mission is voter service. We register voters throughout the community. We have a get out the vote effort to the places where the people are least likely to vote. 
We have forums. Last year we had a forum on the uh, candidates running for mayor and the candidates running for the city council. And we have publications throughout the area in our libraries and other places telling people everything they need to know about voting in Pima County as well as what your elected officials are and how to contact them from our area. And that's city, state, county, federal, and tribe. The second part of our mission is voter education. And we have six voter education programs every year. And they have to do with the issues of the day, like gun safety, or immigration, or the 2020 census. And we have those open to the public, so anyone can come and learn from a panel of experts. We have those in September, October, November, and January, February, and March. We had a radio show. We had an Ollie class. We have a speakers bureau. By the way, if anybody has an organization where you have speakers come, please give us a call. We would be happy to provide speakers to you. And third, what we have is advocacy. We advocate at the state legislature, and we also have requests to speak. Now, what I call requests to speak is sitting at home in your pajamas and letting the state legislators know what you think about the bills that they are considering. It's a computer program where you go online and you tell the legislators thumbs up or thumbs down and comments. So we have all of those. We have training classes on how to do that. So we are a very active organization. We have, if you look around the room, there's about 300 people here. We have about a little over 300 members. And of that, over 200 are active members. We are very proud of that. But I'll tell you something else I'm really proud of. We pretty much get along with each other. <laughs> we do. We like each other. We support each other. We respect each other. We help each other. It's a wonderful organization. So I would like to end with a little short song. And this is to inspire you to vote. And if you like this song, you're welcome to go on to my YouTube channel and, you know, <laughs> Take that URL down and, and send it out to your friends and family. And this is the, oh, wait a minute, by the way. Okay, for people who are not league members, what is the date of the general election this year? November 3rd, exactly right, very good. Now, I know a number of league members have beautiful voices, and uh, you've heard this song a couple times. Please sing it with me if you would like. It's called Let's All Vote. On November 3, be part of the team. It's time to come to the aid of America. On November 3, you need to be seen. It's time to come to the aid of America. Go to the polls and cast your vote. Time to have your say. Let your voice be heard now. We can make such a beautiful way. We can create such a beautiful day. On November 3, let's dream the dream. It's time to come to the aid of America. On November 3, you need to be seen. It's time to come to the aid of America. We need your vote. We need it right now to help democracy. Vote for the people you like the best. You are the key to keep America free. On November 3, be part of the team. It's time to come to the aid of America. On November 3, you need to be seen. It's time to come to the aid. Come to the aid. Come to the aid of America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Be sure to vote. <laughs> and now I have the honor of introducing Frida Johnson, 
Now, she's not only been a past president once, she's been a past president twice of our organization. She's going to talk to us about the history of the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson. Frida. Good morning. I'm going to give you some highlights of our history in the Tucson League of Women Voters. And it begins back in the 1940s when about 50 women gathered in Tucson to form a group that advocated public education about knowing your community. They became affiliated with the National League of Women Voters and in November 1941 became the Tucson League of Women Voters. Dues were $2 annually. During the 1940s, study topics of interest included civil defense on the local scene, health, juvenile delinquency, the need for a woman police officer in Tucson, and jury duty for women. Imagine that. In April 1948, we had 175 members and a budget of $980. We raised money in the community by selling handmade aprons, among other things. <laughs> in 1949, we registered over 2,000 voters. We created a float in the Armistice Day Parade, and we won first place as the best civic entry in the rodeo parade. <laughs> in 1950, league voter information was inserted in over 35,000 gas and electric bills. Over 2,700 new voters were registered by league members. The 50s brought us an office downtown, a new mimeograph machine for $270, a men's auxiliary group, and candidate questionnaires results published in local newspapers prior to school board and city council elections. And the 50s also brought us our very first Pima County book, free to members, but 50 cents to others. Our newsletter over the years began as the woman voter in early years. It evolved as the Tucson voter in the 50s to the 70s, and finally as the voter from the 1980s to today. Over the years, our Tucson League has been actively engaged in supporting a number of causes. First, a bottle bill in Arizona. Alas, that failed. But the next one, Pass, the Motor Voter Initiative, allowing people to register to vote when applying for a driver's license. We advocated for free textbooks for high school students. And we helped support the initiative measure that passed the Independent Redistricting Commission. We also did studies in Tucson on affordable housing, education finance, air quality, climate change, and transportation, among others. We also produced and distributed our signature citizens directory of elected officials covering city, county, tribal, state, and national officials. Creative get out the vote efforts were, were provided to engage all people in remembering to vote. And here today, the sponsorship of Issues and Eggs, our seventh annual community forum and fundraiser. Today, we celebrate the sponsorship since 2004 of Running and Winning. This is our workshop for high school young women to engage in the political process. We celebrate an active men's group. We celebrate our robust diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. We celebrate our recent move to a new office. And we celebrate our vigorous voter service activities, which involve so many of our members. That work, represented by our bilingual brochure, Guide to Voting in Pima County, was achieved through close collaboration with FN Rodriguez and her staff in the Pima County Recorder's Office. Finally, wait till you hear this. Let me tell you that when my son came for supper last week, Unbidden started to tell me about an interesting program he'd seen on gun control on, online. It happened to have been our very own recent League of Women Voters Forum on this issue. It pleases me no end that we are reaching so many people through our work to stream our voter education programs. There's a wonderful document entitled, Lest We Forget, a brief history of the Tucson League of Women Voters from 1941 to 1952. I consulted that to give you some history of our earliest years. It closes by saying, 
Know your past and be proud of it. But live in the present to plan and work for an even finer league in the future. I leave you with that thought. Just a hundred years ago, our mothers and our sires lit up for all the world to see the flame of freedom's fires. Through bloodshed and through hardship, they labored in the fight. Today, we women labor still for liberty and right. Oh, we wear a yellow ribbon upon our women's breast. We are prouder of its sunny hue than of a royal crest. Was God's own primal color born of purity and light? We wear it now for liberty, for justice and for right. We boast our land of freedom, the unshackling of the slaves. We point with proud though bleeding hearts to myriads of graves. They tell the story of a war that ended slavery's night. And still we women struggle for our liberty, our right. Oh, we wear a yellow ribbon upon our women's breast. We are prouder of its sunny hue than of a royal crest. Was God's own primal color born of purity and light. We wear it now for liberty, for justice and for right. So now it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage our moderator for today. And the moderator is Jan Lesher. You all know her. She's the Chief Deputy County Administrator at Pima County. Jan has served on many boards. She's received much recognition for her work, including being named Woman of the Year by the Tucson Metropolitan, I'm sorry, the Metropolitan Tucson Chamber of Commerce. We have an amazing panel for you um, today that she'll introduce in a minute. She also served with Arizona Governor Janet Napolitano and then Chief of Staff of Operations at the Department of Homeland Security under Secretary Janet Napolitano. Please help me welcome Jan Lesher. Good morning, and thank you all so very much. Uh, I, I have a huge thank you to the League of Women Voters on behalf of all of us here in Pima County and in Southern Arizona for the work that you've done. So from everyone else here, could we just get a big round of applause for the League, for their leadership and the inspiration that they provide every day. Thank you so much. Um, it is particularly exciting for me to be here this year as part of, as we look at not only the 100 years, but at the 2020 election. Uh, in looking at today, I've been doing a little bit of looking at some of the data and some of the statistics that we believe we'll be reviewing going into 2020. And while a lot of the data is not yet defining who we may vote for, it's indicating how we may vote and who is actually going to be coming out to vote. And the interesting path of this is that the underlying theme is that this decision in 2020 at every level will be decided by women over 50. So we are them. And actually, um, what's fascinating to see is that a full 34% of the people who will be voting in 2020 are women 65 and over. I am them. I'm looking forward to it. And for all of us, thank you. Uh, what we recognize as well is that we're looking at 2020 and predicting the single largest gender gap that has ever existed in the country with a full 35% differential being projected. So for all of you who are thinking about maybe not only getting out and vote in November, um, but why you need to help each other vote, it's important. The exciting part and the reason that we're going to be the difference is one of the amazing facts to me is when they ask women if we plan to vote in November, 95% of women 50 and over say they will be voting in November. So that's, that's exciting. So our job is to go find the others. And while we've spent a little time here talking about all of us, and with no disrespect, many of us in the room representing that 65 and over group, uh, we're not going to continue much longer without a next generation. So it is my great privilege to introduce a pretty exciting panel that's going to help us understand how we get through the next 100 years. Uh, you do have a brief bio, but I'm going to introduce them all at once as they come up, and then we'll go into questions. Um, first, we have Herminia Mini Frias. Come on up, Minnie. She's a councilwoman from the Pasquayaki tribe. And dear friend. 
she has been involved in tribal government for quite some time, including some time as chair, but she also ran Native Images, Inc. and is serving as the executive director. She's been on international advisory councils for Native Nas Nations Institution and a Bush Foundation partnership. Uh, Minnie holds a master's in public health from the University of Arizona. So yay, Minnie. Thank you so much for being here. Sadie Shaw. Sadie, thank you so much. Sadie's the president of the Sugar Hill Neighborhood Association. I've done a lot of politics, but I don't think there's anything worse than, than a neighborhood association sometimes. So bless you, bless you, bless you for that. Um, she serves on the League's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee as well and has a Bachelor in Fine Arts and in Art and Visual Culture Education from the University of Arizona and is the City of Tucson's Ward 3 appointee for the City of Tucson's Public Art and Community Design Committee. Thank you so much for being with us today. And our third panelist is Emily Morell, a senior at University High School where she is president of the Human Rights Club. Come on up, Emily, thank you. She plans to pursue environmental sciences degree and she is an El Rio youth health educator. She's volunteered for Mi Familia Vota, Planned Parenthood, and Trees for Tucson. So it's pretty amazing. You may be old enough to vote. This is what's so exciting to me, that all of us, again, who maybe started at various times in our life are watching now that um, we will be able to retire at some point because we do have a wonderful new group of women coming along and are going to work with us. So I'm going to kick this off with you, Emily, if you can help us understand a little bit. It's pretty astonishing to me to think about being in school, all the activities with you, which you are involved. Uh, but what inspired you to get involved so young? So um, when I was younger, like my first interest in like activism was um, the environment because my family would go outside a lot and we had a garden and um, so my, my dad, he's from the Caribbean, he's always talking about how we need to take care of nature and so I instantly fell in love with that and so um, in the South Tucson there was a community garden project and I was involved in it and so from that point on I knew I wanted to be an environmental scientist. Um, and so that was one of my first interests. But then um, as I got older, I like, realized I got angry of, at things at school, like learning about history and realizing that it's still occurring, like many things that um, had me angry in school are still happening now. And then um, it's just like I realized that all of my values aligned with each other. Um, so I realized that like politics are something that I can't afford because of, I can't afford to ignore because my everyday is political. Um, so then I realized that as an outlier in society, thank you. Every day is political in some way. Um, and I realized that as an outlier in society, I still have power to support my community. Um, and the more I learned about the world and my identity, the more I realized that like my values align with each other, whether it's like environmental or re to reproductive health, what I'm doing now. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you. A brief astonishing factoid is I'm glancing at her phone and she's got about a size four font. Um, not so much, just saying. It's a little scary. This is in your future, ladies, just saying. Um, Sadie, you are the president of the Sugar Hill Neighborhood Association. What is it that inspired you to finally do that? Um, yeah, so, you know, I was invited to the Neighborhood Association election, which um, before I became president occurred once every year. There was only one meeting and it was during the election. And um, one of my colleagues, Michael Schwartz from the Tucson Arts Brigade, um, let me know that there was um, an election coming up. And so I came to the meeting um, and I wasn't surprised that um, the four people there were the people who have been in the neighborhood association for the last 15 years, um, and they weren't they weren't um, the historic residents of Sugar Hill, and so you know it came that time in the meeting where they said who would like to be the officer for the next year, um, and you know I. I paused, I, I really wasn't about to raise my hand and say I, I want to be president, but um, I realized that I was kind of waiting for um, 
this gentleman to kind of go ahead and say that he was going to be president. Um, you know, and then I asked, well, actually, what, what came to mind was that quote by um, Marion Williamson, um, something about how, like, who am I to, to be this? Um, and she also says that um, we are capable beyond measure if we'd only kind of take that leap. And so, you know, the little voice inside of me just raised my hand and I said, I will be president. And <laughs> thank you. Thank you. For every person who's had that moment of not being willing to put their name forward and to wait for someone else to nominate us because we're shy or something, we thank you because that's an extraordinary act of courage. Absolutely. Um, and a first big step. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, I think as women, we always kind of defer to the males sometimes, and I think we really need to to stop doing that and to you know teach our daughters and um, you know embolden our friends and our family to um, go ahead and pursue those leadership um, roles um, because you know just like with this election, we know that well, women women need to have a seat at the table. Yay! Thank you. You know, as we mentioned that when first. Many of you have seen the studies, they say that when women first got the right to vote, um, married women tended to vote exactly as did their husbands. And I've always wondered how they knew it was the women listening to the men at home. <laughs> I understand they voted the same, but I'm thinking maybe somebody else was providing that direction. I, I do want to take a moment and remind you, you should have cards in your table. Um, we will be, after we get through with the panel in just a moment, we will be taking questions from the audience. And you should all have note cards out there and be able to, in the brown bag, okay, right next to your membership notice for leadership, I mean for League of Women Voters. There are cards and people will be coming around to pick those up and we'll be asking questions in a moment. Minnie, I really want to spend a moment listening to your, uh, your path through the, uh, through the Pasquayaki tribe, the t tribal council. Uh, Minnie and I had a chance to talk the other day, and I think one of the, the, the um, elements that we want to really draw out of this is that uh, th sometimes the challenges in front of us aren't always a smooth path and a clear trajectory headed upwards. Um, that sometimes there's bumps and grinds along the way, and we, she, we were sharing the fact that probably the greatest um, experiences of our lives, potentially, and the doors that opened came from something that we didn't originally realize might have been uh, a good thing. Uh, but it's how you, be, how you bounce back from that and the resilience to move forward. So we are so proud of that. So Minnie, tell us about your role with the tribe. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak to you all today. I, I really do appreciate that. And uh, when they asked me to come and speak, I said, um, how much time do I have? <laughs> Because um, I'll give you the, the Reader's Digest version of when I served as chairwoman for Pascoyaki Tribe and, you know, fast forward it to where I am today. Because it, um, in 2004, I had the honor and the opportunity to serve as chairwoman for Pascoyaki Tribe. And at that time, I was um, very young and was <clears throat> one of the youngest uh, people serving as a chair for a nation that was about, at that time, I think we were about 13,000 citizens, sovereign nation, and a, um, had never had a, a, a chairwoman, you know? So I was, um, it was new, and it was something that was, you know, very hard to accept for, for some people. So uh, it was not something that I was looking to, to do, though, but be, becoming, and even leadership, it wasn't something that, you know, was kind of, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to be a tribal leader. That wasn't part of my, my, my goal. My goal was really medicine. You know, I got my undergrad degree in biochemistry, and, um, you know, I was on the path to medicine. But I ended up going into the path of public service when I was a social worker. And it was the frustration of understanding the system not working for our tribal citizens and um, working in D.C. and seeing that it was really political advocacy and policy and um, that really you can make bigger changes. And that that was really where my strength was. And what always got me in trouble was, the, was this, talking too much, was really turned out to be one of my biggest strengths. So, <laughs> I just had to channel that. <laughs> so I, I ran for office, I won. I was 31 years old, 
got the second highest votes, and um, which was pretty much unknown, you know. And, uh, and, and I ran for chair. And I wasn't running to decide to run for chair, but it was something that people, first of all, people asked me to run for tribal council, and then they asked me to run for chair. And they asked me to run for chair because they said, you know what, Minnie, um, I think you can make a difference because it's all the same people that got reelected, and they've pretty much all been chairmen too. <laughs> and so you have the opportunity now to, to make a difference and, and do something different. And I said, yeah, but it's never happened before. This is kind of different, and I'm, you know, I just really want to spend my first term learning, and you know, not really, you know, I, just, I, I was not really feeling it, but. The other, th the other thing was the encouragement. We're not gonna let you down. We're going to help you. You're not gonna do this by yourself. Uh, so having support, having two other women on the council with me, having elders help me, having other community, having other people on the council, it was like, okay, you know, so the system is set up on our council as a parliamentary system, so they select who the chair is, and so I ended up becoming chair. So I got voted in, and um, the, as soon as I got voted in, I realized what it meant, what politics really meant. <laughs> because from that moment on, it was a battle. Because it wasn't really a battle with the people, it was really that power struggle. And it always was a power struggle, and it wasn't really personal, it was all about the position. And I realized that early on. And so it was just, let's just keep trying to figure this out. Let's just keep trying to figure this out. But eventually, you know, it did get to the point where um, it just, I, w I was always fighting for my position. And, and, um, and eventually, they won. Eventually they won and they removed me from office. And I'm not a person to give up. So when they removed me from office, I, uh, they removed me from office and filed all these ethical charges on me and said, you, did it, you failed to do this, you failed to do that, you did this, you did that. And I said, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, because I didn't do any of that stuff. So I'll just go to my hearing and I'll win and then that will not turn out the way and then I'll go to court and I'll win and so everything will be fine. So it was naive, you know, and, and one of the elders came to me and said, Minnie, don't be so naive. This is not how it works. And I said, yes, it does, <laughs> you know? And, and he said, oh, you got so much to learn. And, I said, and, and he said, I'm like, because this is, how it's, this is how it works. Look, this is how the law's written. Look at this all, con you know, I was showing him all, and he's like, oh, Minnie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but in the end, he was right, and I was wrong, and I was learning about politics. So, they won, and they removed me from office, and they first suspended me from office, and they had a vote, and they suspended me as chairwoman of the Pascoyaki tribe, and removed me as chairwoman from the Pascoyaki tribe. So I said, okay. I went home after the council meeting, and I went to work the next day. And the receptionist looks at me, and she's like, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here, to, I, I'm here for work. So you were removed last night. I said, I know as chairwoman, but I have two roles. I'm still a council member. Because on our tribal council, you have two roles because of our parliamentary system. So you can serve an executive role and a council member role. So I was removed as an executive, but I still served as a council member. So the vice chairman became chair and now I served as counsel. So now they were like, oh, what do we, <laughs> what do, we do now? So I, I sat there in the lobby waiting for them to open the door and everybody's calling the attorney, what do we do now? Minnie's out in the hallway waiting to get inside. And so the attorneys are like, uh, <laughs> what? And so I couldn't get in, I couldn't get inside, but I was right. 
you know? So they called a special meeting, and they removed me entirely. They had to now re re uh, revise the removal to say removed as chairwoman and tribal council, so to make sure I didn't come back. And um, so I was like, okay, now I'm really out. So that created a vacancy in our tribal, um, in our position. So when there's a vacancy and there's more than six months left in um, a vacancy, then you call for a special election. So there was a call for a special election. So when the special election opened up, I showed up at the elections office <laughs> and I picked up a, a packet to run for office. <laughs> and when I showed up, <laughs> The, the supervisor said, what are you doing here? You can't run for office, you just got removed. And I said, I know, by the tribal council, but not by the people. <laughs> and she's like, and she's like, but I said, there's nowhere in the code that says I can't run for tribal council. She said, all right, it gave me a packet ran for tribal council, and I won. <laughs> so I got reelected, and I got sworn in, and I show back up to work, and the tribal council's like, oh, <laughs> what is she doing here? And then they said, you can't be here, we just removed you. And I said, I know, but the people voted me back in. And so then they go back and call a special meeting and they amend the elections ordinance to say, if you've been removed or suspended for tribal council, you cannot run for, eight, for two terms. And so, so then they retro that to apply to me, which you can't. But I, at that same time, I have a lawsuit going on, so I file another injunction. I, I, all this stuff, at the same time, all this stuff is going on in the court, right? I'm suing them in the court. With the, everything is going on. So I'm like, I file another injunction. And so, again, they don't let me inside. And so in, in the end, in the end, I lost in the court, legal battle, sovereign immunity, you can't sue government. And, but, so in a legal battle, I lost. But in a political battle, I won. Yep, there you go. Fast forward eight years, I ran again. <laughs> and I won. Yep. And the same people Mostly, most of the same people that removed me from office, I'm working with them. But it's a whole different experience, and it's a whole different environment, and those things that have happened in the past are in the past, because it's always been about the people. And so it's, it's politics, and it's about the position. And so for me, it's always been all right, but for me, it's always going back to what does the law say? What does the Constitution say? And what, you know, if you're violating my rights, you can't violate other people. And so I just kept going and going and going, and so now I'm back, and, and I think at the end of the day, it's like I earned a lot of people's respect for not giving up, you know, and to, to, to go back and to win and, and to be able to come back and work with some of the same people that removed me, it was like, okay. okay. All right, so moving forward, it's like, hey, we're all working for the same cause, we're all working for the same people, and we all have got to make it work. And here we are today. Thank you. So, I th yeah, thank you. Will immediately, in just a few moments, it's okay if something makes you angry because you can get involved and become to look at, you know, and work for it. You don't have to wait for somebody else to ask you to run. You can stand up for yourself and never give up. I think it's a pretty good way to just get started this morning as we talk about um, another 100 years ahead of us. Emily, I want to go back to one of your areas of activism for just a moment. Um, you've been talking about reproductive health and women's rights. And it's interesting because, again, for those of us at a certain age, 
we were, we were fairly old in 1973 uh, when laws changed in this country. And sometimes I hear that younger women today don't remember a world before Roe v. Wade or how the life might have changed. What caused you to become involved in women's health and reproductive rights issues? Um, okay. Um, so I was, like, it was another interest of mine, but it wasn't, like, my main interest until um, high school. I met a friend who was part of El Rio Rap, and um, I wanted to be more involved, but I didn't really know how to. And so one day, like, when we first got started, she brought me along to a meeting, and I was really nervous. Like, I was really shy. I, I, wouldn't, I wasn't the type to go up here and, like, talk to all these people, and this group has, like, really transformed me to, like, you know, speak up for myself and speak up for, like, my community. And so um, that's where I got started. At first, I was kind of like, oh, this is not really what I was planning to do, but I like it. Um, and so as, uh, with RAP, um, so we teach comprehensive sex ed at El Rio Clinics. Um, and our work is compensated, so I do get paid for what I work. So it's nice, because um, like, as a young person, a lot of time people think that they can like, use us for like volunteering without get, like paying us and it's not fair because you know we we deserve to get paid too um, <laughs> and so i i really liked it because it was teaching me um things about like sex ed that i didn't know because coming from um, a latin ex family we don't really talk about sex and so I, what i knew was like a lot of misconception and so i learned more about being like through being in this group um and then um so that's how that happened, and so I started teaching sex ed at the clinics, and I found that I, like, I really enjoyed the work that I do at El Rio. And then um, a little bit later, I got involved with Planned Parenthood through the same friend, and um, it, it was a different experience because they actually, um, they flew me out to Detroit for my first panel, and I was like really scared. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm 15, and they're flying me out already? Like, what? I was like, I was like feeling like Hollywood. <laughs> um, and so I like really felt valued, like, like my voice was valued somewhere that they're willing to do this for me, even as like a young person. Um, and so that's how I got involved in reproductive health, and I'm still doing it. Um, and it's something that I enjoy, so yeah. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. Uh, and, and maybe Sadie with you, um, while we've talked about the fact that some of the older population does tend to vote, um, we don't see those same numbers in the younger generations and that one of the greatest problems we have I think is that even though not everyone registers to vote and of those who register they don't go out and vote. Is there work going on within the basic community level with which you work to encourage people to vote? Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure of, um, well, I know that there's, um, within Sugar Hill, um, the NAACP is very active. Um, and in fact, um, in Sugar Hill, there's the polling place is at the Donna Lingan Center. Um, and so I think that's huge in getting the community out to vote, having a polling place um, right in the neighborhood. Um, actually, in, during the 2016 uh, primary election, they moved the polling place from the Donna Ligon Center to um, another place, I forget the location, but it was um, probably 20 minutes away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and at that, at the 2016 primary election, my, my vote was not counted. Um, there was a lot of voter suppression happening, and so um, even though I was registered as a Democrat, they had me as an independent at this new polling booth. So I think it's so important to really um, make sure that voter suppression, um, you know, do anything that we can to not make it happen, because when we showed up there at the on 2016 primary election at the Donna Ligon Center, I wasn't the only one who didn't realize that the uh, polling uh, place had changed, and so, um, I, there was some carpooling happening, people trying to take each other to this new location, and so, yeah, I think we really have to um, pull together as a community to do whatever whatever we can to um, get people out to vote. Out to vote. Wonderful, thank you. I'm just gonna remind you again quickly, you do have cards on the table for folks. Brenda's starting to pick them up and others, if you have questions for our panel as well. There is, uh, Minnie, I'm gonna go back to you for a second because you are so involved and so active in so many things, but how do you find time to really stay informed and engaged in the community? It's just part of my daily life, that's what I do. You know, I, I um, you know, being on council, it is really a 24-7 job and so part of it is 
and it helps me do my job better. So the events that um, I participate in, you know, with whether it's programs and services, it, it, um, it helps me to understand really what's going on. And the good thing about serving in a tribal community is that we are a close-knit close -knit community. And so even when all this political ugliness happens, um, we are still so closely connected because we're all, con we're all about our culture and our ceremony. And so all of that stuff can be put aside because what really, really brings us together is who we are as people. And so we always go back to like, wait, we gotta remember who we are. So that is what really connects us. So when, when I can go to you know, education and, and talk to, to students and really find out it, what's going on with um, you know, student success and hear about that is, is very helpful. And yet go to Washington DC and learn about national policy issues and connect that back is really helpful and to be able to to you know have youth like we have here our young tribal um, youth council and that that showed up here you know we always try to connect you, you guys can wave youth council <laughs> we always try to engage our youth and our elders and just keep the community connected but I always stay engaged with what's going on in the news what's going on you know in our community what's going on with other tribes what's going on and just be in the know and I always say this and, and people in my community know this, if you're not at the table, you're on the, you're on the menu. Oh. So I always say, show up. And that's one of the things we have to do as tribal leaders, as tribal or representatives, you have to show up and represent. We're starting to get, thank you very much. Um, some questions and I want to go to that, but I want to take just one moment because we've talked about um, the importance of running for office and um, we, we recognize some people who are currently elected officials, but can I ask everyone who's ever been an elected official or who has run for office and maybe not been successful, but had the courage to get out there and run to please stand up. And thank you for all these people. As, as, as Minnie's experience has shown us and others, um, we're all here involved in politics, but to take that next step and actually put yourself out there is extraordinary. And those are the folks we honor, men and women, so thank you. Um, I wanna go to the questions for just a moment here, and let's see. Uh, a long time ago, I read that when it comes to running for office, women tend to be inspired by an issue, while men tend to be, do it for personal achievement. Um, has this been your experience and would you comment on that? Maybe, Minnie, start with you. <laughs> was it an yes. event that caused you to decide to run and how has it been different? Yes, it's always the event. And, and in fact, uh, most recently I, I had to really contemplate whether or not I was gonna run again because we are going through our tribal elections and just yesterday I submitted all my final paperwork to be a candidate where I have elections in June. So I'm officially running for tribal council again. But I really had to think about it. And you know, I was like, should I do it again? I, nah, I wanna do it, nah. But it was, a, it, it was talking about public safety. It was talking about public safety. It was talking about you know, our community. It was talking about you know, these issues that was the final straw that said, I've got to come back. I've got to continue to help. I have to continue to serve. It's always, and I just had this conversation yesterday as we were driving to Phoenix. And, and we, were, we, were, um, we, were, we were talking about, you know, they asked me, what, what is your passion, the youth council? We took them to their first rally. We went up to go see Bernie. <laughs> so I want to take you to your first rally so you can experience this. And, um, and, I, and I said, it's, it's the issues, because that is really what motivates me is, is making change and how do we help, how do you serve, because, and then how do you set it up for somebody else to continue moving forward? And there's always gonna be solutions. You know, there's always gonna be opportunities for people to help and, um, 
And you know, I, I, even when I was going through all of this, all of these things, it's, I always would be like, you know what? It's just about, it's just about this position. It's not even about me. It's, it's just about this position. Ah, huh, part of it was about me, but, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it didn't matter because I thought, I, I, I'll be fine at the end of the day. I'll be fine. That's why I went to school. That's why I got an education. That's why I do what I do because I can do whatever I need to do, and I did fine. But that is what really, it's always the issues. And in this, in this case, it really was public safety, looking out for a community and thinking really, how can we make it better? How can we do better? Okay. Sadie, I'm gonna to go to you and then Emily. What is it that would cause you to take that next step and run for an office other than the Neighborhood Association and Emily? What will it take for you to decide to run for office in the future? And if it's not you, represent maybe your community and maybe a good time to let us know what we could do, what is it that we can do to help and encourage others to start to run? Sure. Um, well, let's see. I mean, in Sugar Hill, um, the big issue there is um, gentrification. And so that was really um, kind of what, what led me to, to taking that step in um, the leadership role because I, you know, I felt disenfranchised from my community, um, you know, the, the infrastructure was changing, houses were being demolished and are still being demolished, and so uh, gentrification for me is, I think, the most important issue um, in Tucson. Uh, Sugar Hill is definitely not the only neighborhood that is suffering under gentrification, um, and it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing thing, you know. Um, Sugar Hill definitely isn't the only black neighborhood in Tucson. Uh, Dunbar is um, kind of one of the most well-known um, black neighborhoods in Tucson, but um, you know you you don't really see any black people in in Dunbar anymore because it's completely gentrified. And so, do you um, see yourself turning that into perhaps running for the city council at some point? Um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of contemplating it. Um, and I think you know it's important for all of us to to do that. Thank you. It's you know it's a it's a big step for me, um, but I think it's important for like new people to definitely take take the reins and um, you know put make uh, make progressive put progressive ideas on the table um, things that people might even shy away from. I mean, there's a lot of issues um, now that are coming to the forefront. Um, even reparations is um, a bill that's been introduced to Congress, HR 40, um, and so you know there's a lot of controversial things that are happening right now. And I think young people are are excited to take that step. And all we need um, is the the older generation to get behind us and support us in all that. Thank you. Sadie? I'm sorry, Emily, how about you? Will you run? Um, I've thought about it before. Like, well, first I, I want to go to college um, and I want to get a major. Well, you, are you old enough to vote? That oh, might, yes, yeah. I oh, am. Oh, good. Oh. Okay. Well, this year, step. yeah, um, this year is my first year of being able to vote. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I've thought about it, like, when I was thinking about, like, oh, what do I want to be? Because, like, I've changed, like, what I wanted to be. Um, like many times, and um, but it just kept going back to like environmental, um, um, what's it called, <coughs> to the environment. Mm -hmm. And so I, because I live in the small city of South Tucson, and I remember like talking to my dad. I'm like, why are we a small city? Like, why does like the rest of Tucson treat us like we're like like nothing? And I just remember like ranting to my dad about this, and. Um, like him telling, because he was friends with, I forgot, it was like the, the I think the ex-mayor of South Tucson, and he was like, Jose, you should run. And my dad was like, he was telling me, like, um, thinking, like, he wouldn't do it, but I was thinking, like, hey, maybe I should in the future. There like, you go. Um, Remember that South Tucson had one of the youngest mayors in the state mm -hmm. as the mayor of South Tucson, a young woman. So there's a, there's a future for you there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think like the the main um, what's it called the main um, thing that motivates me is like the environment because I live like right next to the highway and it's kind of like um, 
like even like the, the stores with like organic food are so far from where I live and I just started like getting mad thinking about like environmental racism like oh why isn't my community that is treated like this and like what is the city of South Tucson doing it like why don't I know who was like in the council for the city of South Tucson like how can I get to know who they are and I remember um just being like really like angry about it and like writing about it um and I think maybe in the future I'll run for it but um, I definitely want to be an environmental scientist and then go back to my community to help um, like create a healthy future for us. It was wonderful, thank you. Sadie addressed it, and I think we've all seen it. Uh, the issues of voter suppression are getting fairly phenomenal each year. The activities that are going on, and I consider it just a byproduct of negative campaigning, is voter suppression ultimately, because we get a little discouraged. What can the league do here in this community and nationwide, perhaps, to help people understand the importance of voting or even where to vote, and how do we get that information out to turn around the activities of voter suppression? I mean, Sadie, what would have helped you that day that the league could have done to make sure people knew where to vote, how to vote, what kind of information could we do? Um, sure, so I think maybe one thing the league can do is, I mean, work with neighborhood associations um, because neighborhood associations don't really have um, the funding to to send out mailers all the time when there's um, important things happening. So, you know, funding is a big thing. Um, even just using like your um, large mass of people to help help um, the neighborhoods go door to door. Um, you know, just telling people, hey, you know, things have changed a little bit this time around. Um, that would be huge. And just also just technology, getting like things out on Facebook, on on emails, um, even even on the television, on TV. You know, on the f uh, four o'clock news. Um, that's like a big um, big vector for a lot of people to um, learn things. Um, and so, I, yeah. I get a microphone to FN if I could, but I want to encourage you. Um, the county recorder's website has. has as information, and I know that uh, we will continue to push information out, as do others, that, that the difficulty we're having is more and more people vote early and vote by mail, the number of precincts needed are collapsed. And so what you start seeing is exactly what you've experienced, which is instead of that precinct that we went to vote at every time for decades isn't there anymore. And that act in itself is discouraging people to vote. So a uh, lot, lot of information that we can get out, get out and about. Uh, We've been talking, I mean, there's some of this, well, it's great news that we have people running. There's been a few, you know, clinkers along the way, but one, a wonderful question asked was, if you would share a time when you felt your life was abundant, and what was it you were working on when you recognized that feeling of joy that came from it? Emily, start with you, if we might. Um, I think... I felt abundant when, um, like when I found my community like within reproductive health and when I was like a part of the garden project, like knowing that there's other youth like me who are interested in this, like the same thing as me and they feel the, like similar um, about these topics because at times it could feel like, you know, like, oh, why am I like the only one mad? But then I realized that like there's people who are there to support me and like just being part of El Rio, like where adults um, like validate um, me feels like really good. And I feel um, abundant when I'm doing like things that I like to do, whether it's like, like teaching reproductive health or like just being out in my garden or writing because I like to write too. Um, so yeah, I think that's when I feel abundant. Um, for me, probably, um, yeah, after I became president of the Neighborhood um, Association, um, I started to connect back with um, the historic residents of, Sh of Sugar Hill. Um, I've, I've lost a family member. I lost a lot of family members before I became president, um, my Sugar Hill family mostly. And so um, that kind of brought on the Sugar Hill Oral History Project that um, I, I started. And so as I started talking to community members, they they relayed back stories of my own family that I, you know, I never thought I would hear again. Things that I, I didn't even know. And so, um, just just talking to neighbors, talking to community leaders. A lot of them are here. Um, Miss Donna Liggins, uh, Miss Parbia, all people who I grew up with. And so, just just having them around, kind of. Um, hearing their voices and just sharing things with them and just and meeting new people that you know um, work, worked with my grandma and knew my grandpa and just um, 
yes, just a tremendous amount of abundance when, when communities can, can connect together again. Thank you. Minnie? Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of celebrations. <laughs> we have a lot of um, opportunities to, you know, recognize, you know, not just ceremony, but also recognize, you know, when we graduate, when we, um, you know, our annual recognition. So, you know, our Head Start students. And so we really do make the time to appreciate each other and appreciate our accomplishments. And I think that's good because sometimes, you know, we get stuck in, in focusing on the problems and that's what we're there to do is solve problems. And that can really take a toll. And so when, when we can step back and, and say, let's just go and, and, and have a, a, you know, when they invite us over to a graduation or they invite us over to hear the Head Start sing for us, it's like, oh, that's abundant. But one of the, one of the, one of the, the great things when I came back to council, because I am very, um, on the council, I'm, I am really known to be one of like the, 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 the more strong kind of huh, really uh, <laughs> advocates, you know, and they're like, oh no, here comes Minnie, you know, and asking the tough questions and getting on it and just kind of like, and then I have to ask, was I too harsh? Like, did I? And then they're like, no, Minnie, keep doing Minnie, you know, just keep doing. What. But you know, one of, the, one of the biggest compliments that I got was from one of the elders that came to me and said, you know, I, I, I hope to be on council long enough to be like you and to be an advocate the way you advocate. And I was like, whoa, yeah. you know? And, and she said, because the way you do it, you know, you do do it with respect, but you know what to ask and, and, and people, you know, they respond because that's what you're supposed to do for our people. And to me, that blew me away. And that's where I felt like, I'm doing it right because sometimes I've got to check myself but to have an elder tell you you're doing it all right wonderful it Thank felt you. felt good and I think it pretty hard not to feel the abundant feeling and that joy when you see new leaders like this coming up and sitting in a room of some 300 league members and knowing that uh, 2020 is going to be different as is the next hundred years with the new generation so let's thank our panel have heard the voice of freedom from that far off western shore. We have heard the echoes calling as our fathers heard of yore. Let us sing it stirring music, equal rights forever. Let us sing it stirring music, equal rights forevermore. We have watched the dawning splendor of a promise in the skies. We have heard his accents tender, lo ye faithful ones arise. Who would equal justice render, I will never more despise. Who would equal justice render, I will never more despise. Good old bugle boys will sing another song. Sing it with a spirit that shall start the cause along. Sing it as we ought to sing it cheerily and strong. Giving the ballad to the mothers. Hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, the homes they shall be free. So we'll sing the chorus from the mountains to the sea. Giving the ballad to the mothers. Bring the dear old banner boys and fling it to the wind. 
Mother, wife, and daughter let it shelter and defend. Equal rights our motto is we're loyal to the end. Giving the ballot to the mothers. Hurrah!